Looking back and throws up the middle. Throws is on his way around. You are watching live to the best damn Cincinnati Reds podcast. This side of Madison Southern High School in Central Kentucky. My name is Santori Miles. We got Cincy James. We got Reds Dad, and we got Jeff Carr of the Locked On Reds podcast. Sorry, Ashley. She didn't like when I scream. How we doing? How we doing? Dude, I'm I'm excited to have Jeff on here. Absolutely. It's great to I hear think, the I think central. Not be fired up right now. <laughs> it's great to hear the central Kentucky um, relationship we've got going on. I did not expect that, but hey, Joey Votto's back, so that's the best thing. That's it. That's it right there. Go ahead, Santori. I was just saying that's the show. I guess. Yep, we're Votto's done. Back. <laughs> we'll see you later. So, no. <laughs> you want to go up, go straight into uh, Brimminghorn? Sure. Do you like honey? Do you like wine? Do you like mead? I think it's beer. I'm not sure. That's where they sell it in jungle gyms. I looked in the wine section for 20 minutes, couldn't find it, found it over in the beer. So maybe it's a beer. Premium Horn Meadery, based out of Delaware. Just won the small rural business of the year in Delaware. Yep. Um, fantastic product, quite honestly. I'm not much of a, uh, a wino or a beer drinker myself. But this one's pretty good. Um, very sweet, very subtle. Gives you a, a nice little buzz that so that's where you're trying to go. Um, always drink responsibly, of course. But use our code HOOTA9. 15% off two bottles of more. Shipping to all 50 states for the most part. Um, <laughs> sorry, for the, <laughs> sorry for the hate that you got, Montana. Apparently, some of the bottles do go there. I, uh, I was corrected by Birminghorn. So there's that. <laughs> Oh, goodness. And the next one that we've got, um, our good friend Adam Rennell has founded Three-Way City, bringing the sights and culture of Cincinnati to fashion. Named after the traditional Cincinnati-style chili spaghetti, our good friend Adam Rennell founded Three-Way City with this in mind. From hats to shirts to jackets, grab a piece of Cincinnati on threewaycity.com today. He's got the Bengals stuff. He's got the red stuff. He's also got the... Uh, FC Cincinnati stuff that's coming out. He's also got apparently a UC Bearcats thing coming up soon. So be looking out for that as well. But right, I, I need to stop everything for a split second. Um, Cause I get the Reds game on over in the corner. Like I think most of us probably do. Right. Um, they, they're, they're talking about the Reds telethon right now. One, uh, they've got a microphone in front of Phil. So I'm very glad that that's muted at the moment. Um, two, one of the giveaway packages had a Joey Votto, uh, nesting doll, like one of those little Russian dolls that they I go inside each other. Uh, and the, the really fat Joey Votto nesting doll was slightly terrifying. But for $100, it's all yours. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> oh, goodness. But we've got Jeff Carr on from Locked on Reds. Uh, he's been doing this for five years now. Um, he's a lifelong Reds fan. And he is ready to talk some reds. So, Jeff, how are you doing today, bud? Man, I am pumped up. We got a shot for 10 wins in a row to match the winning streak from 2012. Like, before this season started, if you've said we could compare this team to the 2012 team, I probably would have laughed. And as optimistic as I love to be about this team, like, I, I just did not see this coming. I'm so happy with how good they've been. Oh, I mean, I put uh... – I, I guess I can say I was a non-believer, which I think was fair in February after yeah. half the talent got shipped off. But there, there's a tweet <laughs> circumventing around the Twitter sphere right now where I said if this team won 20 games that I would swim through the Ohio River in a polka dot bikini. And the first 10 people that liked it could spray me with like ketchup and mayonnaise like they do at the Bills games. <laughs> I think it was um, 70 games. It was 70 yeah. games. Yeah. What did I say? 20. 20. 20. Oh, I meant 70. Yeah. If this team won 70 games, they could do that. And when they hit 35, I retweeted it, and I was like, oh, well, it looks like it's on pace to happen, and I'm happy about it, you know. Um, 
but it, it's interesting you bring up the 2012 team. Um, because I, I did try to compare and contrast this team. They're, they're built vastly different. I just think this one's built more offense. I, I think 12 was probably heavily supported by pitching, but Ooh, yeah. I'll uh, I'll leave you up to that because you're probably the expert on the Reds between us. Well, and when it, when it comes to 2012, I mean, they did a thing that it's never going to be done again. Let's just go. It's not even that hot of a take. Like, they had one guy start one game – who wasn't in the starting five? Mm-hmm. And it was Todd Redman. Like the, I was at that the, game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it was because it was double header. Like the, the the weirdest of circumstances had to happen for the Reds to not use one of their main five guys. So the fact that that happened, that's just the weirdness of baseball. Because then, of course, Johnny Cueto goes down in the first playoff game, and we all just kind of look around and say, you know. Why didn't this happen in June? And so he could have been back for the playoff run and we could have gotten this out of the way. But I I think that the way that this team scores is just what is so fantastic about them. They're not a power team. And I know they hit three home runs last night, but it's, it's all about small ball. And it's not like small ball from like 30 years ago where it's the first guy that gets on the next guy bunts him over and the next guy gets him in. Like, they just go first to third on everything. They go second to home on everything. Like, like Ellie De La Cruz scoring on Joey Votto's single last night. Like he was about to catch Jonathan India at the plate. And it's not like India was going slow. It's just amazing how this team runs. Yeah. yeah they, they remind me of the mid, mid to early eighties, St. Louis Cardinals. They mm-hmm. remind me of Willie McGee, uh, Vince Coleman, that crew, uh, mm-hmm. Lonnie Smith, that was a first to third, steal bases. You never want to put a man on base kind of team. And they didn't beat you with a bunch of thunder. They they, they definitely um, they kept the chain moving, and that kind of pressure that they apply is um, very, very similar, I think, to those early 80 Cardinal teams. And I love any time. As much as I hate the Cardinals, I love when you can compare the Reds to the Cardinals because mm-hmm. that's the team that we want to be. The, the the As much as we don't like them, I think it's mostly out of just jealousy because they, until this year, this year it looks like they might actually have a losing record. They don't often have a losing record. Yeah, it's it's been a thing of beauty to watch the Cardinals kind of implode this year. I'm going to be honest about yes, that. It <laughs> yes, it has. Yes, it has. It's well, they sorry. Had- they it's, haven't had a losing record since 2007. Like, yeah, yeah. Our, so uh, it's it's nice. It's been 15 they're the, years. They're, they're the Pittsburgh our, Steelers of Major League Baseball. They are. Gosh. Our locked on Cardinals host is the uh, PA guy for the Cyclones. So sorry, JD, because I know that he goes to some Reds games and oh, things JD, like that. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I played <laughs> I played in the golf scramble with him. Uh, the Jackpot Joey scramble. We played nice. together. James, you just know everybody. I, I get around like. Uh, I guess that <laughs> made a beach boy song about you. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you were at the game last night. Mm-hmm. Talk about the atmosphere. Talk about seeing Joey Votto in the Viking gear after mm-hmm. that mammoth home run that he hit. Just, just give us your experience last night. I told, I went down to the game with my wife and I told her, I said, the best case scenario is if Joey homers and the reds win. It's what happened. And just the vibe. I mean, he came out for pregame warmups, just stretching and doing the thing, you know, the high step in and the running backwards thing that guys do to stretch their legs out. And even when he did that, everybody who was over and I sat down in the foul territory of first baseline, uh, everybody who was down there, as soon as he came, they stood up, started clapping, started yelling for him. He stopped his stretching and he clapped back and he waved and took his hat off and stuff. Like he understood what the moment meant so much for Reds fans, even as much as it meant for him to be back, but he understood what it meant for all of us. So whenever he came up for his first at bat and he got that standing ovation, like you saw it, the the umpire and the Rockies catcher were just like, yeah, we know what's about to happen here. Let you take a minute. You do your thing. And it was just this amazing feeling, the rocket off the bat. I know it was right at Doyle, the center fielder, but it was a rocket. And then you just knew, this is a different dude because he didn't hit. What was the what was the stat they said that the three exit velocities that he hit last night? I don't think he had anything near that last season. So he's already showing you he back and he's yeah. ready to roll. Yeah, the, the three balls he hit last night are harder than anything he's hit in the last year. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I'd put something out there, and James, I know you had retweeted it. Mm-hmm. Let's keep in mind, he. I think he said during the post game interview last night that last night was the ten month mark from his surgery. So this man hasn't played in more or less call it a year, mm-hmm. right? Basically forty years old. And his first at bat is lefty on lefty and hits 105 miles an hour off the bat. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. Like that doesn't happen. Most guys, I mean, you see it with, you know, Senzel when the, when he comes back, it, it, there's been an adjustment period or anybody when they come off of an injury, it typically takes at least more than two pitches before you hit one 105 off the bat. Unless you're Jake Fraley, who first swing, he takes his home run. Um, but it's just, it's, it's astronomical talent. It really is. Um, and the one thing you had said is he kind of understood the moment. He didn't necessarily, well, not only, I want to say, did he understand the moment, he understood the situation he was coming into. I mean, he said it multiple times yesterday where he almost said it without saying it. This isn't really my team anymore. It is your team. It's always going to be Joey Votto's team. But he understands what he's coming into is the future. I'm not here if I can't play well. And it was funny because there was a lot of people who were kind of on social media going, man, I hope he doesn't really mess up the mojo, which I can understand both sides to that argument. Um, Yeah, you get it. um, But Joey kind of understood that too. And he was like, I'm only going to be here if I can contribute. And I think that made everybody kind of go, okay, well, we're, we're on the same page then. Like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what that's what really stood out to me, and like the the pregame uh, press conference that he had, and and you kind of mentioned it. He did the thing, and we we know what Joey does. Joey is a very uh, conscientious person when it comes to what he says, and usually you can watch a mental progression of what he is going to say as he's saying it. Because like in the in the uh, pregame press conference, he had a moment where he was just like, "It's so nice to come to a team that's." Um, <clears throat> and he like thinks about it for a minute and you're like he was about to say a team that doesn't need me but he didn't want to say that because he didn't want to make it seem like you know hey no you need me because i'm me like you can't not have me <laughs> but he understood that he has to prove that he is still him yeah. like this isn't just going to be something where it's it's going to be a given he walks in and he's the king of the hill so right. i think that you know you know it was so key for that moment and then him talking about you know you earn respect by your play on the field you know you can be the nicest dude ever in the clubhouse but how do you play on the field that's what matters and then he just delivers such an amazing performance i i was so happy and among the debuts obviously it wasn't a career debut for him but among the 2023 debuts we've just been really really lucky as reds fans this season to see so many amazing debuts Let's give you a real quick uh, update in the game. Please don't. Uh, Jones Jones uh, let off with a solo shot off of Ben Lively, so it is one to nothing. One uh, there's out. one out. There was one. One out. Yeah. One out. I'm sorry. Second he didn't lead off. But, yeah, there is one out. Uh, McMahon's okay. up to bat. It is 0-1. This is a perfect transition because the deadline's creeping around the corner, and uh, mm-hmm. I talk a little trash on here. I know you – I don't know how much you do on, on Locked On because I know you're probably a little bit more professional than we are. Um, <laughs> but I'd prefer not to see Luke Weaver pitch a whole lot of games after the trade deadline. Um, who are you thinking for trade deadline candidates? Uh, definitely the first guy that comes to mind is Lance Lynn. And I think there's a lot of folks that are thinking, you know, Giolito. There's some folks that have said, what about Shane Bieber? Um some other names being thrown around there. Some of the Tigers guys come to mind. However, the best guy on the Tigers rotation is Eduardo Rodriguez, and he's got three years left at like $49 million. So that's going to be something you got to get ownership to sign off on. Um, but I'm looking straight at Lance Lynn right now because I think you could get him and you could get the White Sox to eat his salary and you don't have to trade very much to get him. Um, but whether or not this is indicative of what real life would actually turn out to be, there's a website called baseballtradevalues.com that I like to look at a lot just to kind of understand valuations for things. And I built up a trade today where I sent Nick Senzel and Reese Hines to the White Sox for Lance Lynn, and the White Sox would pay the rest of his salary for the year I said, you know, $9 million, whatever it is. Cause he's making 18 million, you know, halfway through the season, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not a math expert, uh, unless it's batting average or, you know, 
something like that. But when it comes to that trade, I do that in a heartbeat. I know that Reese Hines has really kind of had a nice hot streak here recently, but his entire minor league career has been marred with strikeouts and injuries. And then you've got Nick Senzel, which we know about. If you can flip those guys into veteran starting pitcher help, whose numbers do not tell the whole, his ERA that everyone's going to look at and say it's 6.85. They're going to be like, that That looks terrible. Why would you trade for him? They don't tell the whole story. There's so many underlying numbers that say that he will be a lot better on a different team. And I think that he would be the veteran presence to boost this rotation and give them a steadying force of at least six innings every five days. Well, he eats a lot of innings. The ERA is in play. The the number that bothers me with Lance Lynn isn't necessarily the ERA, but it's the whip. And that's one that I put probably a little more focus on than a lot of people do because there's a billion, billion, billion stats for pitchers nowadays. Um, but I do know in his last start, he had, what, 15 Ks? 16. Yeah, yeah. 16. He freaking tore him down. Um, so he's still got it. Um, and, you know, Derek Johnson's a good pitching coach. At, at least I believe yep. so anyway. Um, you never know. Um, there's a few guys out there that I would be interested in gunning for in the deadline. Um, it's going to take way too much time to go into all those names, but I'm with you. I would – Really, really love to package a couple of the the minor league guys that maybe aren't performing the way we hoped they would. Um, and I'm, <laughs> make fun of you want. I know a lot of people like him. I'm kind of off the whole Nick Senzel train. I was yeah. never. I really, really wanted it to work, but I've probably been off it for about a year and a half, and I'm I'm ready to move on. If I can get even an adequate bullpen arm out of it, I'm I'm all for it. In our group chat, he put the. Uh... Put Senzel in another city. That's what he put in our group chat. We were like, well, how do you really feel, Santori? Well, someone said, Can you put um can you put Spencer Steer in center field? And I said, Yeah, you can. Um, I, I wouldn't do it all the time, but he can play there. And they yeah. said, Well, where would you put Senzel? I said, in another city. <laughs> but yeah, he's that works. Not he's got Yes, Steer could play center. Um, He's a yes. little bit of a liability out there, but I'll go with the bat right now. Well, and Sinzel's a guy that, I mean, he had a nice month there after he first debuted this season, but for the most part, he's a dude without a position because he was starting to look pretty good defensively at third base, and, well, now he does not need any time there because Ellie De La Cruz needs to be playing there every day or – if not Ellie, then they're probably going to have Newman and Ellie will play shortstop or whatever that looks like. Well, in the um, moment they clear up a spot, possibly at third base, it's probably not going to be too much longer before Encarnacion Strand comes up. Exactly. So, And that's what we all want. We'd rather see him get at bats than oh Senzel. I mean, we were looking at yeah. the lineup tonight, and I was like, the only way this gets better is if Stevenson just does – one, doesn't have an off day. That's just all that came mm-hmm. down to. And – I mean, I'm really not mad about Benson because he's hitting like 400 over the last two weeks. Yep. So it's like mm-hmm. my my one through eight tonight is fantastic. And and really, Benson, he's a guy that I don't know that the average will continue, but the on base and the slugging will. And then when he gets on base, he's going to be a force. He's going to constantly cause problems for opposing pitchers and opposing defenses, which is the MO of this team. So he fits right in. And I, I, I think... Tyler Stevenson, what are your guys' thoughts on this? Because he has been the most frustrating player for me to watch this year. Um, he's. Should we start with Red's dad? <laughs> Let's let him start, and then we'll go up to you. And then we're, I love we're him, but he's around. been frustrating. So much. The, the, um, man, the man formerly known as Bengals' dad. Yeah. We have, <laughs> so this is my dad. Just so um, I, half the time we get through half the show, people are like, oh, I didn't know that was your dad. So just yeah. for clairvoyance or for, uh, for transparency's sake, <laughs> Uh, we're going to echo a lot of the same things because he kind of raised me and all that. So we'll just, we'll let him go. I'll probably end up just being like ditto. And then on to James. So, so we're, we're talking about Stevenson. That's, that's yeah, a, yeah. that's a guy that's bugging you right now. Um, <laughs> Stevenson, as long as he just doesn't try to pull the ball is really, really good. Mm-hmm. He's better off letting the ball travel deep and going to right field and right center field. That's when he's at his best. I don't know why he gets a little pull happy. He seemingly is missing pitches that are right down the middle and they're knee high or below. It's like he can't bend down and get the ball. I don't know what's going on with him, but I think that's a tremendous ball player just waiting to get out again. Um, 
he really reminds me of Paul Goldschmidt is who he reminds me of. He's got the build. And if you look at Paul Goldschmidt, it's a lot of balls to right center field. I think they both have really good inside out swings. Um, I, I certainly am not overly concerned with Stevenson, but uh, no, that, that's my take on it. Okay. No, we're going to go two good. very different directions here. <laughs> but, <Uh-oh. laughs> um, so it, I don't necessarily disagree with anything you said. Um, I just have a lot different opinions when it comes to Stevenson. Um, and it, it's never made sense to me, but this is a fact of the matter. When you're constantly bouncing around between positions, and I'm going to say DH is a position here, um, it can mess with your offensive approach because you're starting to worry about different things. Um, you can't just kind of key in. It's one of those things where, I used to always get upset when the lineup would change every single night drastically. Cause it was like, if these guys don't know where they're hitting the responsibility is different going into work every single day and not necessarily knowing what your job is. It's hard to get focused and dial in um, DH to catcher. Isn't too much of a transition because it's just either catching or not. Um, but I think probably what's going on is there is a little bit of bouncing around. Um, he doesn't necessarily get to be in the same spot every day. I think that does cause offensive slumps. My thing with Stevenson is I worry so much about him as a catcher because he is a freaking foul ball to the hand away from missing half the season. Mm-hmm. Um, he is injury prone. That's not a knock on the guy. It's just what it is. Some guys' bodies are made to take a punishment. Some aren't. Um I would prefer he is at first base or DH all the time. I know there's a lot of people that say if you've got a catcher that can hit, you let him catch. There's a lot of different philosophies there. I am on the opinion of just stick him at first, stick him at DH, let the guy hit, and just let him get comfortable. Um, The issue with doing that is now you kind of have to carry a third catcher if you want to consider Stevenson a catcher, which now eats into your 13 position players that you have. Mm -hmm. And now that kind of roadblocks the whole Encarnacion strand thing. So it's like, okay, I have this internal battle with myself right now of, do I stick him at catcher so I can keep everything else moving? Or do I keep him healthy and hope he breaks out and I roadblock somebody else? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at with him. It would be a lot easier if he was hitting like a demon right now. And I would just stick him at catcher or first base and figure it out. But the fact that he's inconsistent, I have to try and figure out something to do with him. So the more flexibility he has is great, but it also roadblocks other options that I have. So I'm like, have a lot of frustration just with that scenario in general. And, and he, you know, last year he, he was out for so much. He, the plan was kind of to have him rotate between first base and DH and catcher. And they, I think they put a number like, was it 58 games or something like that? They said that they wanted him to catch and that was it. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've got Spencer steer who is playing a pretty good first base. Um, So that, and you've got Joey Votto back. So that kind of log jams that position. So now Mm -hmm. you've only got DH and catcher. So now it's like, okay, well that's kind of where he's going to be. I don't see where there's anything else. And I'm the guy that, I think I'd rather them not carry three catchers. Yeah. And in the preseason, when they were talking about this three catcher plan and they had hatched it, you know, in December or something like that, it made a lot of sense. Keep him healthy, make sure that he still Mm -hmm. keeps his bat in the lineup, but he's not constantly, you know, in the path of those foul balls. The problem is they stopped playing him at first base April 27th. He hasn't played there since then. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the emergence of Steer there at first base. And, and with Joey's injury, they shuffled a lot more things around than they thought. And some different things worked out differently. Um, but when it comes to Tyler Stevenson's bat, I think that all of the changes that they made really actually negatively affected that. And I don't think they expected it. I think they thought he was going to continue to be an 800 OPS kind of guy, no matter what position he played. And the thing for me that just stood out the most was whenever David Bell said in a post game, and I forget which game this was after, but he said this about Tyler Stevenson. He said, you know, we just realized that we were asking him to get better as a hitter get better as a catcher and get better as a first baseman. And that just seems like too many things. It's like, 
Yeah, don't think that uh, hindsight should have told you that. I think a regular sight should have seen that. <laughs> but because when you when you play three positions, you want to get better at three positions. But uh, the the whole matter, the whole plan with this, like, yes, I agree. They need to get rid of the three catcher plan and give him a little bit more consistency because we've heard Spencer Steer, we've heard, um, you know, Matt McClain, guys like that say, you know, I'm happy playing multiple positions. Tyler Stevenson's not necessarily been one of those guys. And I think that as a manager, you have to understand that about your players. Each individual person has different leanings. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you reds that I do think that he's going to bounce back. Um, it was, and it's probably a little bit of recency bias, but watching him last night, he was back to being ground ball machine. It was probably because he was trying to pull the ball a lot. There was a lot of ground balls to the shortstop mm -hmm. and, and there up the middle. Um, and it feels like the Reds were challenging him a little bit by bringing Joey Votto up and saying, you're batting six right away, and we're moving Tyler Stevenson to eighth. Because I thought, like, in the way that I figured the lineup would roll, Tyler Stevenson would be one ahead of Joey Votto, and instead they had him two behind. And I think that was kind of a kind of a challenge for him. And now that he's he's you know not playing in uh, here Tuesday night's game, uh, I wonder what we're going to see from him moving forward because you have the game Wednesday, off day Thursday, and then the Braves coming into town, which he he has a very you know strong connection with because that was his favorite team growing up. Yeah, real quick, um, Ellie is up, two men on, one out. Um, this is my custom Ellie De La Cruz headband that Bengals oh, yeah. and Bourbon, my, our buddy Matt Schultz, made. It is 4-0. and We're going for 5-0. and uh, So hopefully that will happen. But uh, it's 2-2 two, two, two right now. It's actually full count. Curve. <laughs> yeah. Man. He had to jump out of the way of that one. Curveball almost got him. Well, let's hope he gets a pitch to hit. I'm going to have ahead. I'm way ahead. Of I'm going to have to great. move. Move it. There we go. Oh, kind of refresh. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Not great. <laughs> Not great. I pulled the string on him. Okay. Um, so we've talked about the trade deadline. We've talked about Joey Votto. Let's jump into – seems like a good good point to switch gears here. Let's talk about the young guys. Let's let's talk about Matt McClain. Let's talk about Spencer Steer, uh, Will Benson, Ellie. Let's talk about these guys. Give us your, your take on – you know, may, maybe just go down the line or what, however you want to do it, but let us know what you're thinking. It's amazing to me the – quickness that these guys have really taken to the league um it's something that i've heard some i've heard mark sheldon say something i've heard charlie goldsmith say like all the all the beat writers are saying things like the reds winning nine in a row makes no sense when you figure in that most of their roster are rookies or sophomores like so many young guys that lead this team on a winning streak. You usually talk about veteran teams that are in the smack dab in the window of their contention that build these kinds of winning streaks up. And it's not necessarily what we would have expected here, but Matt McClain, all of these guys, and, and as much as, you know, Ellie has not quite taken off yet, like he has in the minor leagues, you don't hear any frustration from them whenever they struggle and whenever they succeed, their their demeanor is all right yes we did good what's next what are we doing next because they understand that a win in june as important as it is is not the same as a win in october and they're looking for those wins in october and i think that it's the mentality more than most that has really impressed me because sure the, the production has been phenomenal and matt mcclain deserves the all-star votes that he's getting and he should get a look at the all-star game but it's just the mentality that these guys have that has really intrigued me red's dad speak on that too well i've never i've never seen a crop of players come up and, and immediately have an impact um and yeah i mean i think ellie is going to take off at some point um I think uh, I think we saw more of what McLean probably isn't as good as what we what we saw. I think he's gonna he is leveling off right now, but I think he's gonna be a very very competent ball player. Uh, I think what you see in Steer is what he's going to be. He's been the most consistent of any of the players that they brought up. Um, you know, we haven't talked about Abbott. I mean, what a sensational start! He's not afraid of big league hitters. He goes after them. Um, 
that that's a quality I'd love to see in any of the pitchers that they bring up. Don't be afraid of the strike zone. Um, these guys, even as good as they are, still only get a hit three out of ten times. They got to just keep that in their head, not to just give free passes because then that, that gets to the increased whip, as my son said. You you don't want to give these guys free passes if they're going to hit one out like Tom Browning, make it a solo shot. Um, now I, I I like everything I see. Well, I think we should talk a little bit more about the pitching after we wrap around again, though. Right. Yeah, I mean, going into just how improbable it is what the Reds are doing right now, because, I mean, we, we really, really, really haven't talked about that. Like, it's been a – everybody's going, oh, my God, this is surprising. We didn't expect it. Okay. You have four guys on the roster right now that are rookies that are playing exceptionally well. Um, Ellie will get there. McLean's top in all-star voting right now. Not the top, but way up there compared to everybody else. Um, Steer is, you know, he looks like a five to ten year vet up there almost all the time. Um, You talk about the guys that are just on rookie contracts alone. Um, For all of these guys to come up in the same year and to be as productive as they are at the same time, truly is less than a 1% chance. Um, And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that. To get one of them to hit right when they come up, yeah, that happens. We we see, you know, guys get called up and they catch fire right away. We see awesome debuts all the time. It's great stories in baseball. Have two of them, uh, every once in a while you'll hear about two guys kind of coming up together. Three, not really. Four, I don't know if it's ever really happened before. You're on pace if Encarnacion Strand comes up and plays well to have five. Mm-hmm. Um, so now we're going to combine that with the fact that we have the third worst starting ERA in baseball. <laughs> yeah, right. And the fact that this bullpen went from zero to hero in a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You combine all of those factors together, four to five rookies all hitting at the same time, not having your star player and Joey Votto having one of the worst starting pitching staffs in baseball – in your bullpen making a complete transition with little to no upgrades, really. Um, none of that should have happened. The, the fact that they have a winning record in late June is astronomically improbable. Well, and their Taking, biggest free agent addition, they just cut. Right. <laughs> they, all the money they're spending isn't here. Right. They had 25 on the books for Votto. He just showed up. You had seven and a half on the books for Will Myers. They cut him, and you're paying Moustakas to play against you currently. (laughs) All of the money, and Junior, don't get me started on that. All of the money that you're spending isn't currently doing anything. Right. With the exception of Otto, who just came back. It's just, on on paper, if you truly laid out percentages, I I don't even know where it would be. Half of a percent chance that all this, the stars aligned. It's not supposed to work like this. I want to I want to layer one more thing in, but let's hear from Cincy James first. Well, to piggyback on that, I mean, we've got guys down in the minors that haven't shown up, like we've talked about. Chris, Christian Erconacci and Strand, Connor Phillips is working his way up. That's another arm that we could really, really use. Um, and to think that all these guys are pretty much pro ready, and we don't even have the space for them right now. Like we, we can't find the space right now. We're wondering because they did DFA uh, Will Myers. That opened up a spot on the 40-man roster. What does that mean? How are they going to fill that? I haven't heard that they've filled it yet, but I don't – maybe maybe you guys have heard something, but oh, huh. how, how will they fill that? Will they go ahead and do a trade right now? Kind of early, but I, I felt like even before they put Hunter Green on the IL to call up Joey Votto, I felt like – they have something in the works. Um, don't necessarily know what that is, but the the quotes that we've been hearing from Nick Crawl are all pretty pretty positive. I mean, he's never going to come out and just say, "Yes, I have lots of money to make moves," but you know, he said, "Yeah, we got flexibility there," and whatever flexibility might mean, it might be a small trade. But even a small trade at this point. The Reds just need a get-me-there guy in the rotation, and that's why 
I mean, Lance Lynn is not the most sexy dude, and there's probably some other guys out there that the Reds could go make a good trade for a sexy dude, uh, or as Joey said in his post game, you know, handsome, handsome individual. Um, but he could get you there, and that's really what the Reds need to focus on because that wouldn't cost you a top flight prospect, and it probably wouldn't cost you a lot of money, especially to be on next year's books. Mm -hmm. And there's no guarantee that guys like Lodolo are going to come back at when they say he's going to come back. So you kind of, and what's he going to come? Is he going to come back at, right. you know, pl playing well, or is it going to take him a little bit to get well, going? And like that with Ashcraft, when he comes mm -hmm. back, yep. what version are we going to get of him? Are we going to get last year's version or this year's version? Cause those are two vastly different ballparks. There's, there's two different versions from this year too. Yeah. <laughs> the the first six year, games he was nails. And, and then yeah. the next six games he was get, getting nailed. Wow. Um, when, <laughs> or Red's dad. You, you said that you had another layer to throw on there. Well, yeah, because we're focusing on the rookies. Let's not forget about those second-year players or third-year players, whatever they are, mm -hmm. with Fraley, Friedel, and the closer deals. I mean, nobody expected any of those three guys to play like they're playing right now either. It, it's just remarkable how much this team has grown between what they've learned in the minor leagues, what they went through in the last year or two on, on, on the really, really poor – teams uh, it's just it's amazing uh, what, what they've got with that nucleus with basically one and two year players yeah but again i know we're talking about pitching and lance lynn they need two starters they need two average to slightly above average starters and they need another lefty in the bullpen whether that's chapman or not i don't know but I, they need two lefties in the bullpen and two starters and i think you can count on this team Winning the division, they won't get, be a pipe dream anymore. You got a and couple other process now. I would not wait till they did that two years ago when they got. Uh, I was just talking to Tyler or my son about well, this guy yesterday Gibbons. or this today. Who, who was Gibbons. it? Michael Gibbons. Gibbons. Yeah, they went. And they got those two or three guys with the bullpen. They waited till the end of the trade deadline, and they lost like two or three grand day, uh, games in the um, in the division in a period of like a week, and then they make that trade, and it's like. You're too late. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, why not do it now when you got 90 games left? Why wait till they're 60? Let's extend this lead and put this thing away. I, I, I don't know what they'd be waiting for. One month of salary for two or three of these pitchers, Lord knows we've got enough. We've got <laughs> enough money that we have decided to jam in our pockets and not pull out. If they really want to win, I think they should go now. I'm with you. And that's why, because I, I think Lance Lynn, because I think White Sox, like you think of teams that already know they're out of it now mm -hmm. because, oh, yeah. you know, folks bringing up Shane Bieber and stuff like that. The Guardians aren't out of it yet. No, the, NL, the, the NL Central is bad. The AL Central is way worse, <laughs> although the White Sox and the Tigers uh, as well are definitely out of that division. But the Guardians are not. The Guardians and the Twins are going to be deking that out all season long trying to fight for that spot. So you do have to look at those. That's the one thing that is annoying about doing trades now is that there's enough teams that still think they're in it. Um, but also the whole idea, and I've seen this take as well, is like go get Chapman to get yourself another lefty in the bullpen, but also to take him away from potential trades that either the Cardinals or the Brewers or something like that could make. Uh, that would be it'd be a double win at, at that mm -hmm. point. So I'd be interested yeah. to see. And I still, I don't know. I still look at the Brewers and I wonder a little bit, and this is a little bit off topic, but I was just thinking about the Brewers. I almost wonder if they're thinking about tearing it down because they are not where they're supposed to be. Corbin Burns is almost done with arbitration. They can't pay. I mean, they should be able to pay him, but they have drug it out to this point. Like, I don't know, man. Like, we might see the Brewers tear it down. And when did, when did they get rid of Hader? Last yeah, last deadline. Trade him to San Diego. I mean, if, you, if you're going to give up on a guy like Hader, I don't know how a team that that wants to be a championship team gives up on a player like that. They were in first place when they did it. They were ahead yeah. of the Cardinals. Like it seemed like a weird flex. Seemed like it, a almost like Bill Belichick told him to make that trade. I think. Well, it, <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things that I, I don't. I do this a lot more with football than, than I do with baseball, but I think I'm pretty spot on with this one. Um, I always like to look at roster building and salaries and potential moves a couple of years out. Baseball, it's a lot harder because 
it's a lot harder to predict with baseball, in my opinion. Um, if your team is spending money on a closer, they think they're good. Mm-hmm. One, because you don't, that's the last piece you need, right? Yeah. If you're in first place and you get rid of your closer, you don't think you're good. You don't, <laughs> you don't have a whole lot of confidence moving forward. Right. And if you are a good team and you have a good closer, you don't get rid of him. I, I don't understand that. That it's to me. That's, that's why like all that it, John Heyman stuff about the Reds train Diaz to the Mets. I was just like, oh come on. Yeah, you got nothing to write about today, so you're going to write about that. <laughs> Throw it out that. there. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, I get it. Um, are are you done with your thought? Because there is a question in yes. the that I think is pretty good. Yeah. Um. So one of our regulars, Jay Lack, um, who do you predict the front office sending away? They, you know, they've got to have something in mind. What like are, are there guys that you are looking at right now, Jeff, and thinking, OK, this guy is not going to be on this team for another month. Like they're going to be gone. I think it's Kevin Newman is at the top of that list. Um, Ooh, yeah. I think when they made that trade. Number one, I don't like the trade. I liked Dowry Moretta, and I don't think they gave him enough of a shot. But Kevin Newman is not good against right-handed pitchers. Yeah, it's all left-handed, baby. And 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 I mean, obviously, the leadoff home run last night was huge. But I just I thought that he was on the list of we're going to see what we can get out of him at the deadline, and he's played very well. So I think they could get something from him. Maybe they even package him with a Senzel to get and, and maybe I, I didn't try that but maybe you package them together to get Lance Lynn or something like that yeah. but I, I just I look at Kevin Newman and I say if you can trade him and you bring up CES I think you've upgraded because I think defensively Kevin Newman's fine he's he's right there where he's not going to hurt you but he's probably not going to want to go gloves or anything like that yeah. and then on the offensive side like as long as he's facing a lefty he's going to be nails but righties I would consider a platoon so I think that he's probably got to be up there on the list Senzel might be simply because he's a man without a position um and I I thought and this is just it's still it still uh boggles my mind in a good way that the Reds DFA'd Will Myers because I really thought they were going to force that in there and they were going to make sure that he rebuilt his value to the point they could trade him for something Mm-hmm. And they're like, you know what? We don't have time for that because we're serious about things and we're not going to force that. Yeah. So I, I definitely give them a lot of credit for that. But I think it's probably Newman and Senzel. Um, and I, I can't think of a lot of other guys that they would be looking to give away for something. Santori's got a hot take. I think I think I know where he's going. I think we've uh, talked about it. <laughs> there, and I know Crypt wants uh, – he calls me cutthroat miles when I get angry. Yeah. Um, there you go. If there's one of those guys that I could get rid of yesterday, it would have been Nick Senzel. Um, I'll probably be pretty harsh here. He's a career 240 hitter. He misses a ton of time. He gets hurt. You can't rely on him. Um, he's currently hitting about 240 again this year. He's hasn't gotten a whole lot better since they brought him up. He hasn't lived up to the hype. He disappoints me more than he actually excites me. There are times, and maybe this is just his personality, that great things will happen, and he doesn't, when the camera shows him, he just kind of seems pretty stoic. Um, He doesn't really seem to fit the culture of what's currently going on with the Reds. And my dad said this last night. He kind of reminds me of a lot of the previous regimes, and that's not necessarily his fault, but he is a connection to it. Mm -hmm. He gives me a lot of those, like, Zach Cozart vibes, where it's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, he's here. He's here. Um, <laughs> he's adequate on defense. He does have a very strong arm. He's got a pretty sharp glove over in the corner. Um, but you need to be able to hit to be on this team. And he's not hitting exceptionally well, and I can't trust that he's not going to break a toenail on a blade of grass in center field and be out for a month. Um, <laughs> and then sometimes he'll come back, and he'll have like a really good week, and then he'll fall mm-hmm. off the face of the earth again, and then he'll show up on the IL with – a fucking bruised eyelash there's just everything goes wrong with that guy it's it's he's never we, we talk about oh you know ellie's gonna take off and steer took off mclean took off he's been up here for three or four years and he hasn't left the fucking runway yet 
<laughs> Dude, what are we doing? It's yeah. just it, – it, I think that's one of those, like we said with Will Myers, I think – I'm just going to say it for both. It's time to just rip the Band-Aid off and admit defeat on that one and yeah. just go. That's not the hot take I thought you were going to say. No. Because we've, we've talked about this, and I thought that you were going to go with um, – well, there's a reason this guy's not up yet because they want to. Oh, I, I toss, I toss that around just to get people pissed off. Christian Encarnacion <laughs> Strand, could they use him? Who knows? I, they could if they they get they something real good for him. You'd get a real good pitcher prospect for him, but I don't know if I'd do it. No, I mean, I you, you've got a. I mean, he might be better than all of them down there if the numbers translate. That was the hot take that you threw out there I, i've like, thrown that out before but i don't necessarily <laughs> believe it no he's got the one stat that i just i almost think it should make him untouchable and that his minor league career he's had what was it over 500 at bats and he has hit over 325 and this is over all levels of the minor leagues and he's in like a a, a group with like Mike Trout and Vladimir Guerrero and Julio Rodriguez and name everybody that's at the top of everybody's list. And that's the same group of guys that he's in there with. So it's like, man, as much as it'd be interesting, and I bet you could get you a Shane Bieber with a CES. I just, I think I'd rather see him in a red right. uniform. I'd rather have CES potential for the next five to six years of control yes. than a year, half a year of Shane Bieber. Um, it's one of those things where, I, I've got a really, really good thing going for me right now. As we said, these guys are one to two years into six years of control. I ain't paying any of these guys for the next half a decade. Uh, I'm not about to lose that flexibility either. Yeah. Um, hey, Jeff, I, I've got a question for you. In, yeah. in football, everybody's got a comp. It, it comes it comes out where it, you know this guy reminds me of this guy. I was talking to Santori the other that, day, and we were talking about CES. He reminds me of a, a particular Hall of Fame caliber player that uh, no longer plays in the major leagues. I'm just wondering, does he remind you of anybody? I was thinking, and he's got a much higher batting average than this one individual, but um, just the power and stuff that he has shown. Oh, hey, there we go. Does that mean three? I Sorry, I haven't seen it yet. It's not caught up. Oh well, guess what? It left. Friedel scored. <laughs> TJ Friedel, man. <laughs> oh, Friedel scored. Okay. Hey, one, one of those second um, and third year guys. <laughs> yes, that was. By the way, he there is he a guy. Is. Okay, I'll let me let me. Okay, well, I have a thought. I, I hope I hope you go where yes. I'm going. He's I, I know the, where he's gonna go. He, it's he, your favorite thing. He's my favorite story because he got picked up because oh, nobody knew he was available. <laughs> I right. want a comp. I want a comp first. Yes. The, yeah, yeah, go. Yes. So the con the comparison that I keep going back to is I really think he looks like Adam Dunn with his power and with the ability to hit the belt all and and he has a pretty good batter's eye up there as well. Hopefully he's a better fielder than Adam Dunn is because. Eh. But <laughs> when it comes to him at the plate, I think he's going to really put all the fear. And I know that Adam Dunn's not the Hall of Famer you were talking about, but um, I'm curious as to who you're thinking. Miguel Cabrera. I like that. He Always liked like, him. He look. He's he's very very still at the plate. He's got very quiet hands. He's got a very steady um, just approach, and he doesn't he doesn't take the long stride. He doesn't overswing. Looks a lot to me like Miguel Cabrera. I like that. I, I've always thought the 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 conversation between him and Joey and. Obviously, in the early 2010s, I was a much more overly biased Reds fan than I am now. Now I'm a little bit more objective. But uh, back then, I thought, oh, yes, Joey has a really good conversation. They're very close. They, they weren't that close. I mean, Miguel Cabrera was way better than Joey was. But, I mean, it's just the, the ability to hit, and you couldn't get Miguel Cabrera out. Like, if that's what we're getting in CES, then there ain't a pitcher in this trade market that I trade him for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Also, game update, and this might be the most important update of them all. Uh, McLean just got a hit on a slider. So, how about that? Ooh, did, did they pitch you blow it away? And he actually did he go the other way with it? It went right back up the middle. So, kind Good of enough. Good enough. Didn't pull off it. And he just got thrown out at second. So, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> um, I like the aggression. Oh, that was a good throw. 
It was a great throw. <laughs> it was right on the money. Uh, you can't make that any better. Um, yeah. But thinking, and, and and I had thought this whenever he hit the three-run home run, but thinking about T.J. Friedel, because uh, you, you mentioned the second and the third-year guys and kind of looking at them. Like, I mean, India of these guys was the most highly touted one. When you look at T.J. Friedel, Jake Fraley, and Alexis Diaz, um, T.J. Friedel, like you said, no one knew he was available. The Reds got him because of that. And he never made any sort of top prospect list as he was coming up through the Reds farm system. And no, then he, he shows scouted up. scouted well. I mean, his grades yeah, yeah. were through the roof. Yeah, everybody was like, oh, man, he's he's pretty good. So he's top top guy. No, nah, no, nah, he's not top guy. No one ever expected anything from him. Jake Fraley was thrown on at the end of the Winker Suarez deal as it was Williamson or um, – wait. Yeah, yeah. Williamson um, and then – Shoot, who was the other guy that they got? I, I it was. I looked at it the other day. It was Williamson, Fraley, and then one of the minor leaguers. Oh no, it was Williamson, um, Williamson, and Connor Phillips as the player to name later that everybody couldn't stop talking about. Yeah, and then oh yeah, by the way, we got this guy that's ready to play in the major leagues right now named Jake Fraley, and he's been amazing. And then. Alexis Diaz, whenever he broke camp with the team, everybody's like, oh, he, he's related to Edwin Diaz, huh? Oh, that's all right. We got a guy. Maybe he can be as good as Edwin Diaz is. And he is. <laughs> like, that doesn't happen. And, and these guys just absolutely came out of nowhere. And then, obviously, Ellie, by the time he got called up, was the number one prospect. But whenever the Reds got him, I mean, the story is widely circulated now. Like, he thought about quitting baseball multiple times because – he just wasn't being scouted. The Reds paid 60 K for him. It wasn't like, I mean, they just, they just signed a 17 year old shortstop out of Chinese Taipei for 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. Um, Lang Chi in and they, they sign way less for Ellie and Ellie's going to be the guy that changes this franchise. So it's the way that this team has changed from scouting and development over the last few years has just been the biggest and hardest thing to talk about because you can't just, you know, oh, hey, by the way, the scouting and development department's great. Let's talk about that for an hour. Um, but that's the reason that this team is where it is. Well, the other part of it, I think, is, and we've mentioned it several times, where all of these guys are coming up and playing at a, a very productive level right away. Um, that's something to be – that's not a coincidence, and that's not dumb luck. That's, you know, I, I'm – I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I used to coach high school ball for a while. If everybody's coming up with the same approach and doing the same thing and playing at the same consistent level, culture. that's culture, that's a set foundation, and that's development. And that's mm -hmm. like you pray for minor league systems like that, especially when you don't have the money to compete with spending with the Yankees and Cubs. You have to have things go right like that. And all of these guys have a professional approach. They tip, they, for the most part, they lay off really nasty pitches. They're not free swingers. They're not all trying to hit bombs all the time. They spray the ball and they run the bases. That's taught. That's not something that, oh, hey, all five of these guys play the exact same way at the exact same time at the exact same age. Wow, got that lucky. No, that's, <laughs> that was on purpose. Right. Yeah. I, I got another I, question about, I got a question about Connor Phillips. Mm hmm. The guy's pitching very, very, very well down there, as good as he can possibly pitch. So he's going to get moved up very quickly to AAA. We've seen in our lifetime plenty of players that skip AAA. Mm -hmm. I think that is something the Reds should consider doing at least while Hunter Green's out. I would give him a look, a non-pressure look. The conversation consists of we're not going to win the pennant because you're here and we're not going to lose the pennant because you're here. Have fun. Let's see what you can do, kid. Mm -hmm. I, I'd give him a shot because I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to see Weaver anymore. I really don't. Yeah. I want to see any more of that. Yeah, he. If anything, I'd like to see him out of the bullpen. But even then, I'm just like, Gugh. like whenever right. the Reds signed him, he came from the Royals, and the Royals didn't want him in their starting rotation. So why do we want him in our starting rotation? I don't know. Like I, I hoped that he would figure it out. He isn't. I don't see it happen. I don't ever see a scenario where he pitches a third time through the order. And as many pitches as he throws the first two times through the order, that means you're talking about four or five innings at the nice. most as his ceiling. So that tells me put him in the bullpen. So what? when I, 
I mean, yeah. but but with Connor Phillips, like what he has done that is so impressive here recently. When he was with Dayton, and I got the chance to meet him last year at, at a couple of Dragons games, and he just has this mentality, just like I'm better than you. Period. I'm going to get you out. But he had this weird thing <clears throat> where he would walk a lot of guys. But the last like three or four just outings, watch. absolutely beautiful. Oh, that was funny. He tried to catch it. Didn't quite catch. It. Tried to catch it with his face. Um, but his last. I didn't, I didn't see it, so I don't know what we're laughing at. The guy pulled foul a foul ball, ball, hit off the base coach, it hit off the net, and then bounced. And the guy tried to catch it. And base coach jumped. didn't quite catch it. Um, okay, but but yeah, they 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 said you know you need to cut down on your walks, and he's cut down on his walks last three outings. So I I could see him doing the Luis Castillo route and just skipping Louisville altogether. I think that would that'd be a lot of fun. We could use a shot in the arm. Yes, yeah, for sure. And he's um, got stuff like stuff with a capital stuff. Well, we, it'd be double we stuff. Do, we do a double stuff. Here. Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Overstuffed. Oh gosh, yeah. you have what's the oh. new one? Overstuffed. <laughs> double stuff. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, that, that's our food segment. That'd be Connor Phillips. He's double stuff. I was going to say we we have another co- we have another co-host named Greg Luther, um, and he he kind of inadvertently came up with this thing. Uh, and we, we call it Lutherisms. Um, basically what you do is you take, you take a player, you compare them to a food. Um, and so, so his, the, I'm sorry the, for cutting you off. The, the first one, the first one was Andy Dalton. And he said, Andy Dalton is like a grilled cheese sandwich because sometimes it's just what you need. Other times it's like, I don't want that. Get it out of my face. <laughs> and so well, we've got, this little thing here that we uh, play once it's time for Lutherisms. What are you? A grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so. I like that. And you can even add on to that. He's a grilled cheese sandwich because usually it depends on how good the tomato soup is as to how good the grilled cheese sandwich is. We, we have how had this conversation about was, a billion yeah. times. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> he, he did have one that he wanted to give to you. Um, okay. And he went to the game tonight. So, you know, he pulled nice. a you last night. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, Ellie De La Cruz is who he wanted to give to you um, as your Lutherism. Compare him to a food. He's a porterhouse steak. It's going to take you a few minutes to get into it, but when you really do, you're going to appreciate it. You you understood the assignment perfectly. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> I think about food and baseball way too much. It only makes sense that I think about it together. There you go. <laughs> that was perfect. I, mean, I don't know there's anything else but uh you guys think that's about a good spot to to end it there what do you think anything else we want to hit real quick jeff you got anything uh you guys are promoting over there locked on um nothing too crazy as of just yet uh actually working solo i worked uh, today tomorrow and uh wednesday or yeah today and tomorrow uh, cause Steve is busy with his day job, but he will return on Thursday. We're going to have a live episode on Thursday at four. So that'll be a lot of fun. Nice. Awesome. Um, well, Santori, do you want to, you want to get us out of here? Yeah. I want to watch the Reds. <laughs> I didn't think I'd be saying that in Lake June, but I'm right. I'm right. I'm ready to rock and roll. I, I got everything. Jeff, it was it was, it was fantastic to to have you on. Um, Thanks for having me, guys. It, it's great to have meaningful baseball conversations at this point in the year. I don't know how many times in my life they've been dead at this point for the season. So, um, truly, you know, it's good to have good conversation with people that kind of sound like they know what they're talking about. I'm tired of getting in Twitter fights with people who tell me that we need to like bring back Ken Griffey Jr. or something. I don't know. Like I see weird shit all the time. Um, <laughs> truly, you know, would love to have you on again. Hopefully this uh, this streak continues. We're hopefully going for win 10 in a row tonight. Hot damn. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Crazy to real. Say. All right. So for Cincy James, Red's dad, otherwise known as Bengal dad, Jeff Carve locked on. Greg Luther is probably running around Great American Ballpark with a shirt off right now. I'm <laughs> Santori Miles, and this was Rally Around the Natty. Have a good night, everyone. And right into the stretch. Looking back and throws up the middle. Throws is on his way around.